All right. What's up, my friends? Welcome to the Wise Idea Podcast with Christopher J. Harris. I am your host, Christopher J. Harris, and I'm so excited and so honored that you taking the time to hang out with us each week where we are focused and on mission to provide strategies for hearts to be inspired and for heads to become wise. Our goal, of course, is to inspire everyday people to live wise lives. I am personally passionate about life and leadership, family and marriage and ministry, that is the church. And so that's the focus of this podcast. John Maynard Keyes said uh, one time, ideas shape the course of history. So I'd like to edit that a little bit and say that wise ideas positively change the course of lives. So make no mistake about it, and we say it all the time, when wisdom becomes a part of your life, your entire life in every area and every way gets better. And so if you're new to us, we release a brand new podcast weekly on Thursdays. And a lot of you may listen to this podcast with friends or in groups. And we'd love to hear about those groups or those listening parties that are happening around the world. So send us a message at info at thewiseideapodcast.com. And uh, we follow up with you. We may even give you a quick shout out one day on the podcast. Thank you to those of you that have been sharing the podcast and the information with your family and friends on social media. That really, really means a lot to me. Of course, the notes and the resources are available for us to send directly to your inbox. So you'll need to go to our website and subscribe right there. And if you're not already subscribed on iTunes, then we want to invite you to do that. And then, of course, you can share it that way as well. Guess what, guys? We are spreading the wealth. We are now on Google Play. We're going to be on Stitcher really soon. And uh, we'll also be on iHeartRadio. So I'm excited that our borders are being expanded. Well, guess what? We've got another amazing guest lined up today, and uh, it's none other than Tony Morgan. Tony, how are you today? It's good to be with you today, Christopher. I'm doing well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on. This is uh, kind of one of those days, like, I guess a dream come true, like you meet one of your folks that you've been following for a while, and uh, I get the opportunity to actually interview you today. So this is really going to be fun. Well, it's a dream come do- true for me today, too, because I was just thinking, gosh, I wish I had a chance to talk to Christopher today. So there you go. <laughs> well, this is two worlds colliding in a great way. I- I've got, man, uh, you know, for those that are that are um, looking at this on video, they might see this. But if you're listening to this on audio, I've got, man, I've got a, a collection here. This is some some good stuff. <laughs> this book here, man, this book was a, was a save the day uh, life raft for me. Uh, from 2004 that I've got here, a book that you wrote called Simple Strat- Simple Strategic Stuff. I've got the other one as well about volunteers. Um, you've been killing cockro- cockroaches for a while. Um, That's right. I've got a book here as well. I-, I wish there was a way for me to send this to you and let you autograph it, but we'll figure that out some other day. <laughs> Today we're going to focus, though, in a real way on your latest book called The Unstuck Church. And uh, man, it's it's incredible. We'll we'll get into all of that kind of good stuff in a minute. But this is really uh, for those of you that are listening to today's podcast. Uh, this is really um, a conversation that I'm having with Tony, and you get an opportunity to eavesdrop on it. And so, uh, Tony, if you're ready to jump in, let's do it. Um, I, I first want to give our listeners and those that are viewing this via video. Just a quick intro of who you are, and I, I'm not um, I'm not interested in reading your full bio because if they just wanted me to read, they they go to your website. So quickly, just tell us a little bit about who you are and a little bit about your background. Well, yes, I, it's uh, been a fun journey through life, and uh, I accepted Christ when I was in high school, and uh, can only explain that from those early days in my faith journey, really had a sense uh, that God. A place to calling on my life to be a part of the local church and to help help the church become more effective and healthier and experience growth and uh, reach more people uh, through the gospel message and uh, just a real passion for what God has done not only in my life then but this opportunity to be able to share that with others so that's been encouraging for me I'm married I Emily and I uh, have been married gosh, since 1991. I can't do the math anymore. That's a lot of years. Uh, We have four kids and uh, our oldest has her own job and uh, she has her own health insurance and her own cell phone plan. And it's good to have our first Morgan off the payroll. We have a son. uh, He's a sophomore 
at the University of Georgia this year and a, a, a Dogs fan. So uh, I don't know if you have any Georgia fans listening, but uh, he's a supporter of the Dogs. And then we have two younger girls still at home with us, Abby and Brooke. And so we have a, we have a full house and a lot of parenting in front of us as well. Um, I, my, uh, my journey through life uh, started out with a business degree and then a degree in public administration. And I was in local government. I was a city manager for a number of years. And actually some of those stories from city management have filtered their way into my books through the, in, the, uh, in the past as well. But I was called into full-time ministry uh, back in 1998. It's hard to believe. It's 20 years ago now uh, that I in started in full-time ministry and had the opportunity to serve full-time with a few great churches, uh, both in uh, uh, Granger Community Church in, uh, near South Bend, Indiana, and then New Spring Church in South Carolina. Uh, my friend at Westridge Church here in Atlanta allowed me to be a part of the team there part-time while I was starting the Unstuck group uh, when that got started back in 2009. So uh, it's been fun being involved in a local church. And then since 2009, uh, being a part of what God's doing through the Unstuck group. And that has been phenomenal because over the last year, we've worked with about 100 churches on the ground. Uh, churches of all different shapes and sizes, small churches, very big churches, churches of all different denominations, all, all, all different ethnicities, all different cultural contexts. Uh, we've been in Canada and the UK and Costa Rica. Uh, and it's just fun for me to be a part of that journey because uh, I have learned God's using all kinds of church leaders in all kinds of churches to reach all kinds of people. Uh, and uh, there, there's a great work happening, uh, and we get to see it firsthand, so it's fun to be a part of that. That's incredible. So uh, really specifically, what, what were some of the job titles that you, you held at, at some of those previous churches? Yeah, so uh, I was a, a pastor, we called it administrative services at Granger, and then I also oversaw wiredchurches.com, which was our ministry to other churches and church leaders at Granger. At uh, New Spring, uh, actually tried to avoid having a job title as long as I could, but Perry actually made me end up getting one at some point. And so I became the chief strategic officer and had the opportunity to lead our communications and check technology teams, and then also helped New Spring launch their first multi-site campuses in, in Greenville and in Florence and online and Columbia. They've since opened campuses all over the state of South Carolina, but it was fun to be on the front end of that journey. Um, and then at um, Westridge, in my part-time role, I was actually a uh, part-time pastor of ministries basically at Westridge. And so I've had my uh, hand in all different as aspects of the uh, church as well. Uh, and I, I, I guess that's given me a different perspective of different types of roles that some of your, your listeners are probably in as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I used to live in South Carolina, and so I'm very familiar with the influence that New Spring has and uh, the reach even in the state of South Carolina. So kudos mm -hmm. to you for that, that uh, groundbreaking work to get all that stuff off the ground. So you're, you're a full-time consultant. What, what caused you to take the leap from full-time ministry into full-time consultant? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Um, it's, a, it's probably more a confirmation of what my wife saw in me than anybody, anything else. But uh, I've had certainly other people in my life through, uh, through the years uh, confirm a few things that they saw in me. Number one, just a passion for the local church. But then secondly, a gifting, unique giftedness, I think that God's put in me that combines a lot of different spiritual gifts, leadership and discernment and um, some administrative gifts. And you kind of combine all of that. And what I think God's uniquely wired me to do is help a church identify, this is where we believe God's calling us in the future. But then maybe even more importantly, these are the next steps we need to take as a ministry to see that vision become reality. And so 
that's what I've really tried to focus on at the Unstuck Group is help churches get, a, get a, an assessment of where they are as a church, then clearly define this is where we believe God's calling us in the future, and then make sure that we come alongside churches to really put a specific action plan in place so that the church knows what steps they need to be taking today in order to see that longer term vision become reality. And it's been, it's been fun to do that. And obviously, I can't serve 100 churches by myself. We've had to build a team to do that. And honestly, that's part of uh, the whole purpose of the Unstuck Group from the very beginning it was not just to help as many churches as possible, but it was a little bit of a selfish thing in me that I wanted to build a great team of people folks that I love, people that I enjoy spending time with, good friends uh, that also happen to be high capacity leaders and very gifted at what they do to serve churches as well. And so it's kind of been this dual path that I've been on with the Unstuck group. Let's help as many churches as possible get unstuck, get healthy, have a bigger impact, but at the same time, build a great team of friends that I get to serve alongside. That's incredible. So, you know, let's, let's dig into a little bit of the books and um, some of your uh, wheelhouse and passion, which uh, there's a, quite a bit of overlap for me as well and, and overlap for this podcast and for my audience. Um, I, I, um, I have dubbed myself uh, just in conversations with friends and within our church as a prophetic strategist, right? <laughs> And, uh, you know, I, I don't know that that's a, probably not a real phrase and probably a little bit reaching a little bit. But um, one of the things that I'm very passionate about is, is strategy within our churches, right? The back office and building systems. And it's interesting to me, though, Tony, how many people um, still uh, believe that as long as Sunday looks good, everything else should fall in place. And I think, think it misses the point of the systems that help make churches happen. So let's start there. Why, why do you, what would you say to pastors and ministry leaders and others that are involved in ministry or even organizations in general? Um, what would you say to them if they're still not yet, um, if they don't believe yet that strategies and systems and structures are very, very important? So uh, I, a couple things come to mind, Christopher, and the first is this. I mean, there's this clear picture of the New Testament church being a reflection of the body. We are the body of Christ, and in the body, there are all different parts re reflecting different gifts, different personalities, different experiences that we have, different passions that we have, and it's all of those parts coming together that makes the body healthy, and so if church is just Sunday morning, it's not leveraging the full potential of all the parts of the body of Christ. And so uh, I think there's a lot happens outside of Sunday morning uh, that helps the body have health and helps gives us strength and then ultimately allows us to fulfill the mission God's called us to as a church. So that's the first part of how I would respond. The second part is just looking at some some. I mean, I think pretty clear biblical teaching. Uh, for example, we're supposed to plan before we build. And so what that suggests is um, there, there is a building process that happens. I happen to believe God builds the church, but he's called us to be stewards of this ministry. And that includes how we steward the financial resources he gives us, how we steward the people resources that he brings to us, and then how we, uh, how we steward really the energy and focus that we bring to the ministry and, uh, and not only how we use our gifts, but how we're praying for God to move uh, in our churches as well. And it's out of that principle of stewardship that I think we need to be receptive both to the spiritual leading that God's bringing to us, but also making sure that we are leveraging in the best way possible the resources that he's providing us. And the biblical uh, perspective for that is you have to plan before you build. And so um, I think the combination of those two things, looking at uh, the fact that we are the body of Christ and that also we are called to be stewards of, of, of what it, the mission that he's called us to necessitates that we step back periodically and actually plan the steps that we're about to take. And I, I trust that if we're in tune with God's spirit, he's going to direct those steps. He's going to give us that plan, but it still doesn't 
uh, remove the obligation for us to plan in order to be good stewards of the mission he's called us to. All right, guys, we'll be right back. I, I know, I know you are right in the middle of an incredible conversation and you were gleaning things from this incredible conversation that we're having currently. We'll get right back to it. I was enjoying myself as well, but I wanted to interject really quickly and just invite you. If you are listening to this podcast, that probably means that you are also on social media. Well, listen, I'm on social media. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. As a matter of fact, y'all, guess what? I'm also on Pinterest. I would love, 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 love to have you as a part of my tribe, my following, my connection, my social media family. And so if you're on any of those platforms, I'm at CJ Harris, O-N-E, CJ Harris, O-N-E. Would love to connect with you. So while this commercial is even going on, before we get back into the conversation, why don't you go online right now, pull your devices out, pull your computer out, and hit the follow button, hit the friend request button, hit the engage button, and we'd be so glad to have you as a part of our social media following and family. Not only that, as you listen to this podcast, you may be hearing things that are insightful for you, uh, things that are being shared where the light bulb goes off. I would love to hear about those moments. Um, as a matter of fact, you may be listening and there may be questions that you have or things you'd like to share with us that you're hearing. And uh, either way, we'd love to hear from you. So please send us an email. The em email address is info, I-N-F-O, at ChristopherJHarris.com. Again, that's info at ChristopherJHarris.com. Not only that, but lastly, if you have a project or a book or a platform that you'd like to promote or advertise with us, you're thinking that this would be a great audience for you to reach and, and uh, connect with, we'd love to start a conversation with you about that. So please send us an email again at info at ChristopherJHarris.com. And in turn, we'll send you an information sheet and be glad to start that incredible conversation of partnership with you. With that said, guys, let's get right back into this amazing conversation that we're having. Be sure to pull your notes back out. It's going to be fun. Let's go. Yeah, no, that's that's incredible. And, you know, I, I, I'm not presumptuous, but I, I'm going to make some assumptions here that, you know, many of the people that may be listening to my podcast or that may come across this conversation in some some shape or form are, um, you know, lots of different denominations, lots of, um, you know, um, theological leanings. Uh, some may be charismatic, some may be very liturgical and denominational, et cetera, et cetera, even in terms of race and class, um, have you found, um, in terms of embracing strategy, um, some trends with regards to differences in denomination or uh, charismata and et cetera, et cetera? Have you found any trends there at all? Um, it, yeah, it, that's, a, that's a tough question to answer. I think generally we've found more receptiveness uh, in, in churches that have historically maybe had a more um, uh, uh, systematic approach to how they engage ministry. And I mean, the clearest example of that would be Methodist churches. I mean, it's part of their name. There's a method to how they approach yeah. ministry. And yeah. we do quite a bit of uh, work with Methodist churches. Of course, some of that has to do with the fact that I worked for a very large Methodist church for a number of years. Uh, we do engage with many charismatic churches. It doesn't seem as frequently but I think even in charismatic churches, they've recognized this balance that I've talked about, that there is definitely a spiritual leading that we have to lean into as leaders in the church. But at the same time, there's a stewardship principle that God has called us to as well that we have to live out. And so it is really, I think, rather remarkable, the variety of churches and um, traditions that we get to work with as part of the Unstuck group. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I think we, we have really turned the corner. When I talk about the big C, particularly in the United States, we've turned the corner that strategy is not opposed to spirituality or mm -hmm. being spirit-filled or spirit-led. They, they can actually coexist together. So thank, thank you for that. Let's, let's yeah, turn the corner. If you don't mind, let me add one thing, too. Uh, it, is, it is interesting to me, if you look at Scripture, how many times 
um, Jesus is actually encouraging some discipline in our life to produce heart change. Mm -hmm. And maybe the best example of that would be um, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Uh, if I were, were Jesus, I would have flipped those. Uh, I would have said, once your heart is right, your treasure will follow. But Jesus said, once you have new, this new discipline about how you handle your treasure, your heart will ultimately follow. And I think God does the same thing in our heart. He does in our churches. Sometimes we have to embrace new disciplines before transformation happens. And that would speak to then this, this um, necessity and really the blending of both spiritually what God's doing in our lives and in our churches, but at the same time, how he uses disciplines and strategies and systems to accomplish that transformation. Tony, you didn't raise your voice just there, but that was a drop the mic kind of moment. Like you kind of slipped <laughs> on us a little bit. That was good, man. That was good. So let's let's turn the corner a little bit and talk about this incredible new book uh, that just came out um, just a few months ago called The Unstuck Church. And in this book, you you talk about these life cycles. You give give the church seven life cycles, seven phases of life that the church goes through, um, that many churches go through. So, you know, I, I want to be sensitive to our time, but I, I don't, I don't want to belabor the point here. Um, and, and if you don't mind, just take a quick minute and give a Cliff Notes version uh, for everybody of those seven phases or the seven life cycles that a church goes through. You bet. So as we uh, talk about first the launch phase, which is an exciting time. It's a new beginning for ministry for the church. Uh, that then leads into a momentum growth season. And uh, I'll tell you, having been a part of momentum growth with two great churches, uh, there's, I mean, nothing like it. I mean, every, every Sunday you're wondering who's going to show up now because it's God's, you can just tell God's moving in people and there's momentum and energy. Uh, that leads into a strategic growth season. And the d distinction is, moving from momentum to strategic growth, there actually takes some intentionality to sustain that growth. And um, that's actually one of the key words that you'll see in that section uh, in the book is that, that intentionality that's required. Uh, the sustained health phase, it's, it's at the pinnacle of the life cycle. It's what we're praying and, and hoping every church will experience and not just for a, a season. But for a long time, we want churches to remain in sustained health, and we see churches that do this. And, of course, this is a reflection of the fruit that they're experiencing. They're seeing disciples uh, being made. Uh, people are taking steps of faith. And a key word here is replication or multiplication. In other words, there's, uh, there are new disciples. There are new leaders being developed. There are new groups and classes where uh, spiritual formation is happening. And then beyond that, we're seeing churches replicate themselves in multiple services and multiple locations. And through church planting, it's really helping a church move beyond just being an entity in and of itself to becoming a movement. And so uh, sustained health, again, that's, that's the ultimate goal for any church. I think we would all agree. Uh, but then... Uh, churches do begin to plateau at times and then experience decline. And so the opposite side of the life cycle includes a season of maintenance. Preservation is the next phase and then ultimately life support. Wow. And uh, the challenge with those, uh, those three phases, it becomes very, it becomes harder the, the longer you go in that life cycle uh, and the changes become more substantial. And so our desire is to try to catch churches if they are in plateau and decline, to try to catch churches in that maintenance phase because the change that's required in that phase is not as drastic and it becomes easier for churches to evolve, to move forward, and then ultimately get back to sustained health. So that's a quick overview of the seven phases. No, that's incredible. So you know, as I was preparing for this conversation with you, uh, there were a number of questions personally that I had as I read the book. And, you know, even I went online, of course, and just looked at a number of videos that you've already done and just a bunch of other things there that are out there about um, the book. And, you know, 
couple of the questions that I had, I want to just ask here on the podcast because others may have them as well. So the first question, does, does every church go through every single one of the seven phases or is it possible for a church to kind of skip around or just what does that look like? That's a great question, Christopher. And I, we have seen churches that do go through all the phases, but there are other uh, instances where that's not the case. And in fact, uh, you've probably experienced this even in your own ministry or at least talking with other pastors where churches may experience that launch phase and maybe even go through strategic growth. But at that point, you they almost go over time, of course, to the direct opposite side of the life cycle and never really experience that season of sustained health. And so it's, uh, there are instances where uh, churches or ministries or programs don't necessarily go through all of those aspects of the life cycle. I'm not necessarily an Apple fanboy. And so uh, one of the illustrations I use, and you might argue differently, Christopher, and there are people, probably Apple fans that would argue differently, but I think the iWatch went through launch and got some momentum, but I don't think it will ever reach the pinnacle of, of, of uh, engagement in our culture. I just don't think where our culture is today, everybody's looking to wear a watch. Some people will. And so I don't know if, if we were to put app that product on the life cycle, I don't know if it would actually ever reach the pinnacle. Uh, you might argue otherwise, but we see that happen in churches and ministries too, is they don't necessarily get to that season of sustained health. Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree with you on the, on the Apple uh, example there. Uh, I know that there's probably some loyalists on on my uh, <laughs> podcast that are Apple loyalists, and they're probably wondering if they should stop the podcast. I beg you guys keep listening, <laughs> but I probably have some Android people on here that are like, "Yes, turn the volume up." So I don't know. Like, we'll just we'll we'll roll the dice on that and see what That's happens. Right. Yeah, That's you know, interestingly enough, though, um, how do you, how do you think this life cycle fits? Um, because I, you know, when I read the book. Um, you know, there's, there's some clear leanings to see this with church planting, but how does this, how does this fold into the notion of church revitalization? Yeah. What does it look like? Yeah, I do think a particular, for maintenance, for churches in a maintenance phase, I think it's more like tweaks, tweaks rather than drastic changes. But I, I will tell you when a church gets into preservation, preservation, and then certainly in life support, it really is a case where they almost have to experience a, a new launch, where they have to start a completely new work and go back to the first phase if they ever hope to reach sustained health again in the future. And so uh, there, most of the churches that we're working through, this, this concept of the life cycle are existing churches. And they're first trying to identify which of the seven phases are we in and then, based on that, what are the next steps that we need to be taking as a church? But as you acknowledge, uh, for a church that's about ready to launch uh, for a new church plant, gosh, it would be good to have, I think, a resource like this to identify not only what are those beginning seasons of our church going to look like in the launch phase, but to prepare for what's next. And so that that church planter is aware of the different seasons that the church will go through and how their leadership really has to evolve as the church goes through those various phases. Yeah, uh, really, really quick story here. I'm interviewing you, but uh, I think it's, it's kind of funny and serious at the same time. Um, I was doing a leadership workshop at a church one time, and uh, they had a very mixed um, generational church. And there was an older member, uh, older lady that was in this workshop with me, Tony, and, you know, in the middle of my presentation, and, you know, I, I believe in giving honor to whom honor is doing, respecting our elders and all of that. So I wasn't going to ignore this senior lady's hand going up. And so she raised her hand and she said, you know, baby, I, I like what you're saying, but what you're saying can't be true because God said his church ain't going to die. And in that moment, the only thing that I could respond to with was this. And I said it in the most respectful way that I could because in many ways, the church that I was at, the reason why I was there is because they were stuck and the pastor was trying to figure out how to get unstuck. And so I said to this lady and I said to the audience, God's church is not going to die, but yours might. Hmm. And like, 
that it was, you know, it was, it, I didn't have that scripted, but for me, it was very, very sobering. And I think, you know, even having you on today and having this conversation, I think for those that may be listening to this podcast, you know, I think if we don't have hard conversations and figure out how to get unstuck in many of our churches, God's church is never going to die. I mean, the word of God speaks to that, but there are many churches that might. What, what, are, your, what are your thoughts on that? No, I agree. I mean, even the research would show that there are many churches closing their doors every day. Um, and, uh, you know, that, so some of that is just a reflection of the life cycle. Uh, you and I are going to go through the life cycle. Uh, organizations go through life cycles all the time. Products go through life cycles. And I think the church, individual churches, will go through life cycles. The great thing about being a Christ follower and being a church is, though, uh, uh, God's in the transformation and renewal process with us all the time. And I really do believe churches can experience renewal. But this is the key. Uh, we We have to go back to why we exist as a church. And that has to be a priority over the way we do church. And the challenge, of course, is with churches that end up in that maintenance season or preservation or certainly in life support. One of the common themes we see is the way they do church becomes more important than why they do church. And so if we can get back to the, the real answer to that question, why, why does the church exist? I think we'll go back to the Great Commission, the necessity to reach people with the good news. Uh, We'll continue to make disciples. We'll continue to baptize people and teach people and expand the mission of God's church. Uh, We'll become effective in what he really intended the church to be. Uh, But we have to go back to answering that question, why? Why do we exist? Yeah, you you talk about that in the book, uh, the businesses have a bottom line. And the truth is churches do too. Um, you know, obviously businesses are in it for money, but churches are in it for a totally different reason. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to spill the beans on that. I'm, I'm going to tell everybody, go get the book so they can read, <laughs> read what you say there. So I'm, I'm going to ask one more question about the book, and then I want to shift gears as we kind of get ready to land this big plane um, okay. here in this conversation. So, <clears throat> and, I, and I was thinking about this as I read the book. So if you, you, cause you, you, you've consulted hundreds of churches. Uh, you and your team have consulted hundreds of churches. So if you were, were to take all of the churches in America and put percentages based on the life cycle. So mm-hmm. I believe out of the however many churches in America, Tony Morgan, I believe this many churches are in this phase and this many churches are in this phase with that percentage leading up to totaling 100. What do you think the percentages and the breakdown of that bell curve would be? You know what? Uh, it would just be purely guessing. Yeah. But what I do know is we're starting to collect this information from, it's a, actually a free tool on the website. It's called the, the Unstuck Church Assessment. And we've had, I, uh, I think it's a couple thousand now people uh, take that assessment. And we, beginning uh, with the next quarter, so it'll be in April, we'll be incorporating the answer to that question in the Unstuck Church report that we've started to release quarterly. So I don't know the exact numbers on that, but here's what I do know. In our initial review of some of that data, data, Christopher, what was interesting was this, that the assessment showed more churches were in the maintenance phase than the leaders thought were in the maintenance phase. And so the leaders thought they were on the left side of the life cycle, either in launch or strategic growth or momentum growth or sustained health. But when they took the assessment with their team, it actually identified that more of those churches, even though the leaders themselves thought they were in a healthier healthier place, the church was actually in the maintenance phase. And so I think it's a good reminder for us that sometimes we get so involved in the day-to-day of ministry and in specifically what we need to be doing to engage in the ministry uh, that we don't pull back periodically and get per- better perspective of really what's happening in the life of the church. Um, in the four disciplines of execution, they talk about the whirlwind. And in business, of course, you know that whirlwind, just the day-to-day business operations of of any organization that that exists 
the whirlwind exists in the church too. Uh, there, I mean, day-to-day -day ministry, ministry is constantly happening because we're in the people business. Um, and that's always in front of us. But the reality is we also have to pull back from that whirlwind to get better perspective of what's happening in our church, where our churches are healthier, and where we have opportunities to take next steps. Otherwise, we can get lost in what we're doing ourselves and not, and not have a good read on the overall health of the church. Wow, that's incredible. Well, Tony, um, we're getting ready to end this interview, but I want to have a little fun really fast. So okay. Do what I call the quick fire round. And so I'm going to throw some questions at you. The goal is just really quick response. Like it's whatever you first think about, just, you know, that's what you, that's what you offer. All right. Okay. All right, let's go. Um, what are three or four things that you believe over the next 10 years that churches will have to deal with? Uh, figuring out how to engage with their church when they're not at church on Sunday morning, specifically. Uh, figuring out how to continue to balance the priority of evangelism with the necessity to make disciples and to have a spiritual formation process. And then how do we constantly make sure we're engaging the truth, which never changes, with the method, methods that we use to reach the next generations for Jesus. So those are three things that come to mind. All right, what are the first two hours of your routine day like? <laughs> uh, drinking coffee, uh, catching, catching up on the news, uh, reading scripture, and trying to get my brain into gear to focus on what the priorities for the day are. What time does that generally start for you? <laughs> I'm not an early bird, so it's about seven each day. Okay. What's your favorite food? I'm Italian. I don't know if many people know that. So any, anything Italian, I absolutely love. All right. What's your favorite TV show? Uh, right now, I'm going through the office again, but I have lots of favorites. They're usually comedies. Okay. The top three books that you have ever read? Oh, gosh. Uh, so I, I don't have to say the Bible and I'm, I'm going to be okay. Right. <laughs> all right. All right. Yeah. It's a pretty, it's a pretty good book. Yeah. Uh, uh, really, uh, good to great transformed how I think about strategy. Um, I think a uh, purpose driven church really transformed the way I look at church. And most recently, I would say uh, Necessary Endings looked at uh, transformed the way I think about people and teams and how, how we more effectively engage the people that are on our team to accomplish the mission God's called us to. All right. What's been the best recent purchase that's less than $100 that you feel you scored big on? Uh... Gosh, uh, I, uh, again, I'm an Android Google person, and so I just got another Chromecast to hook up to another television in my house. Awesome. Do, do you listen to podcasts? I do. What are your and, three favorites? Well, uh, my absolute, uh, my number one by far favorite is How I Built This. It's an NPR bod podcast, and if, if you're an entrepreneur like me, it will fuel every evil inside you that wants to go build new things all the time. Yeah. I love that podcast. That's a great one. Do you have any others like two more or three more? Uh, gosh, none, none of the other ones are even close to that. Okay. <laughs> I listen to lots of podcasts. Uh, yeah. So probably all the leadership podcasts that all church leaders listen to, I listen to as well. Uh, and then I'm a Cleveland Indians fan. And so I'm listening to their weekly podcast as well. That's lovely. All right. Here's the last question. If you could go back and have lunch with your 20-year-old self, what would you tell them? Um, you don't think you know as much, or you don't know as much as you think you know. <laughs> good. That's good. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this has been amazing. Um, I have been interviewing and having a public conversation with church consultant um, Tony Morgan. Uh, Tony, how can, how, can, how can people find you if they're looking for you or want to find you online? Yeah, really, I would encourage everybody listening, check out uh, the resources, many of them free at the unstuckgroup.com. Uh, that's where our team hangs out. Uh, and then if you want to follow my personal writing and thoughts, 
uh, you can go to TonyMorganLive.com. Yeah, and I have already, I've sent uh, about maybe eight or nine churches uh, to do the Unstuck Church Assessment. So if you're listening to this podcast, I would strongly, strongly encourage you to go and do that. Uh, I'm practicing what I preach. I've done it myself for the churches that I serve with already, and uh, it'll be a great, great blessing to you. So Tony, thank you for being on today. Thank you again for those of you that have been joining us today for the Wise Idea Podcast, another episode where we focused on life, leadership, family and marriage, and ministry. I hope you've enjoyed your time together, our time together. And if you did and you'd like additional resources for the show notes, I would encourage you to go to thewiseideapodcast.com. Of course, we've got an ongoing conversation that's happening on social media. On Twitter and Facebook, we are at The Wise Idea. On Instagram, we are at The Wise Idea Podcast. Um, Of course, we do have a Facebook group that you can uh, get an invite for or do a request of, and we'd love to have you a part of that community and that tribe. Uh, As your host, I'm also on social media. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. Guess what, y'all? I'm even on LinkedIn and Pinterest. You can find me at CJ Harris O-N-E. I'd love to have you as a part of my following and family there. Finally, if you enjoyed what you've heard, please head over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review for other listeners to find us. We're also, as I mentioned earlier, on Google Play. We're on Stitcher. We're on TuneIn. And coming soon, we'll be on Spotify and Our Heart Radio. I would also love, love, love to hear from you directly. So send us an email or a message at info at thewiseideapodcast.com. Thank you again for joining us. We'll see you the next time. And as we say every week, live wisely. Get understanding. Same as the principal thing.